Just let me say that the parables of Christ, Matthew 13, Matthew 21, 22, 25, all of his parables are probably the best place for an egotistical smart aleck to get trapped and break his foolish neck as anywhere else in the Bible. Because Christ, uh, we're going to see here in a minute, we're going to go over it again. Uh, this is one of the most important things to understand when you're reading the Bible. Is Christ tells them specifically in Matthew 13 that he speaks in parables to purposely blind other people and to keep them from understanding. So there's not a more treacherous place in the Bible, not a more scary place in the Bible than Christ's parables. And this is why you find so many interpretations of them. And people just go through there and, and, and uh, just, I mean, you'll hear all kinds of different things for what these things mean. I said this morning in Sunday school while Jamie was teaching, did God say he'd take the wise in their own craftiness? Yeah. yeah. Did he? Did he say that surely in vain the, the net is spread before any bird in the sight of any bird? And that, that those who said it will fall in their own net? Right. Did he say that? Did he say that he would answer Israel according to the idols they set in their heart? And I said this morning that that Bible's booby trapped from cover to cover. It is booby trapped. There's something in there for every wise, proud man that's ever lived. Amen. You know how many people's gone to hell quoting Bibles? Any idea? No. A lot of them. A lot of them in southern West Virginia. Well, I just treat people the way I'd want to be treated. Yeah, let me know how that works out. You know where they got that? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The words in red. That's the words of Jesus Christ. He said, on this hang all the law and prophets. Well, I mean, if, if all you had is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, you wouldn't know anything about the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ at all. Right. People go to hell quoting Scripture. Amen. Don't tell me that book ain't booby trapped. How many Jerusalems are in that Bible? Two. How many Mount Zions are in that Bible? How many kingdoms are in that Bible? Two. How many Christs are in that Bible? Two. Is Satan called the anointed cherub? Yeah. Right. You know what that word is in Hebrew? This is Satan's title in Hebrew. That is not a name. Christ is not a name. It's a title. Right. Amen. Satan is called the Messiah Cherub. And then you have Messiah Jesus. You have Jesus Christ. And you have the Christ Cherub. That's why Jesus is called the Lord's Christ. Amen. How many are there? Two. People, people, people don't get that stuff, man. Dad said it this morning that you couldn't tell Satan and Christ apart unless you had a Bible and the Holy Spirit is telling you the truth. Amen. Yeah. You know how many months Judas preached? Three and a half years. You know how many years Jesus preached? Did they both cast out devils? Yeah. Did they both heal? Did they both hang in trees? Yeah. Are they both going to resurrect? Yeah. You couldn't tell them apart, man. When that Antichrist shows up, the whole world thinks it's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's who they'll think it is. This man walk up to you and say, how you doing, young man? You don't have use of your legs? Take this mark and I'll heal you. I'll take it. Made every wet hole gets up and walks. Just damned his eternal soul. That's the strong delusion about to come on this world, folks. Right. Yeah, yes, it is. People don't get that stuff. They think it's just playing games, man. Who cares what God said? I know what I felt. I know what I experienced. I just feel like. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Hell's full of good people on good intentions, man. And sincere people. Never. Who, who wasn't sin sincere enough to pick up that book? You ain't very sincere if you ain't sincere enough to pick up the Bible. Amen? Matthew chapter 13. Christ is speaking some parables here. And they say, why do you speak in parables? He said, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. It's given to you to know. Why was it given to them and not to others? Right here. Have something to do with the heart, folks. Yeah. Amen? 
Because up to this point, we're going to see, up to this point, Christ spoke plainly. Go to Matthew, go back to Matthew 5. In Matthew 4, 23, we're told that Christ went throughout all Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom in the synagogues. Went through all Galilee preaching in the synagogues, preaching the kingdom. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is, is kingdom doctrine. That's millennial kingdom doctrine. Amen. That, that verse over there that says, uh, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, remember there that your brother hath ought against thee. Leave your gift. That Folks, we don't bring nothing to an altar. New Testament Christians don't have an altar to speak of. Right. The writer of Hebrews says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat. Our altar ain't some, that, that's a literal altar in the literal temple in literal Jerusalem. Amen. That thing will apply in the millennial kingdom. But he's teaching plainly. There's nothing, there's nothing hidden, no parables, nothing. He speaks plainly. It's been said by them of old, you shall not murder. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry at his brother without a cause it is danger of, of judgment, uh, hellfire, if you say full and rock and all that. There's nothing hidden or parable uh, in them verses, in them chapters, is there? Is it plain? Mm -hmm. It's plain in chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9. He gets over into chapter 10. He calls out, commissions 12 men. What did he commission them 12 men to do according to chapter 10, verses 6 and 7? Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 10, 6 and 7. Verse 5, go not to the way of the Gentiles. Okay? And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel as ye go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Got it? Right. Amen. Did God give Israel a kingdom? Yeah. Back here at 2 Samuel 7. You realize that David, before he died, recovered all the boundaries of Israel, and Solomon ruled from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates? He had every bit of the land that God promised that Jew. And they had their kingdom. You get over in the Lamentations, chapter 5, they say, Woe is us. I believe it's verse 16. Woe is us. The crown has fallen. Did God take their kingdom from them? Has there been, has there been any man out of, the, out of the line of David to rule over a kingdom in Israel? No. And God said in Ezekiel that no more shall any man wear that crown until he whose right it is. Talking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So this began what was known as the time of the Gentiles. You come over to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Daniel, who wrote Lamentation? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah warned of a 70 year captivity that would come upon Israel because of not keeping the Sabbath. God said, you owe, you owe me 70 years, the land will rest 70 years as long as you're in captivity. Daniel's down there in Babylon and he's reading Jeremiah and says that 70 years is about up and he starts praying and confessing the sins of Israel. And an angel comes down and says, I'm a Daniel, man greatly beloved of God, uh, know and understand, 470 weeks are determined upon thy people. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, thy holy city. That's not the church. It's not the Gentiles. That's not Rome. It's not Washington, D.C. It's not New York City. The, Jerusalem runs the world. Oh, yeah. Jerusalem runs the news. Everything going on in the news right now is linked back to Jerusalem. Right. Amen. Don't care what it is. It's linked back to Jerusalem, I promise you. The Arabs are fighting in the Middle East over Jerusalem. America's giving Israel weapons, and the world hates us because of Jerusalem. That's all focused around Jerusalem. And God said it'd be like that thousand years ago. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone of the world. Actually, we're giving weapons to both sides. Well, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. I'm, it doesn't matter. You're right. We're funding the Muslim Brotherhood of our Christians. People are like, why are we giving the Muslim Brotherhood money when they're killing Christians? Do you ever think maybe the United States agrees with that stuff? 
I mean, this same government kicked the Bible and Jesus Christ. Amen. And it has to do with God completely out of every aspect of American life. Amen. And then you think that they don't approve of the burning of Christians? But we're the USA. Mm -hmm. United Satanists of, of America. Amen. Now here in these 70 weeks of Daniel, you can't find a more satanic nation on the earth, folks. Mm -hmm. This is the most humanistic self-willed, egotistical nation on planet Earth. Amen. Amen. Nowhere else in the world are you going to find a preacher get up and correct God 300 times in a 30-minute message. <laughs> Satanism, man, it runs the churches, it runs everything. Amen. In the man. But Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, thy holy city, that's, that's Jerusalem and the Jews. And he says there, he says, first off, in the going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem shall be seven weeks or 49 years. And, and the city will be rebuilt, the wall will be rebuilt even in troublous times. He says, and to the Messiah, the Prince, shall be how many weeks? 62 weeks. That's 434 years. That means from here to here, was 483 years, leaving seven years left or one final week. <laughs> During this time, the Bible prophesied four world empires. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Who was in power when Jesus was crucified? Rome. Well, then they were all, they were all, they, were, they had all already come. Right. You have to understand that everything is in place right here for everything to have been fulfilled Amen. right here. Right. Right here. Amen. Was the church prophesied? No. Amen. Could the kingdom have come and there not been any church and God still be true? Amen. You better believe it, man. God, Jesus Christ came to confirm the promises made to the Jews. Amen. And it was only upon their rejection that God came to the Gentiles and had to call another man out and reveal special revelations to him Amen. for this parenthetical age that we live Amen. in. Amen. So when Christ comes right here, the kingdom is at hand. Right. Amen. John, oh. Jesus Christ said over there in Matthew chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, he said, all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. Right. John marked the end of the law and prophets. Amen. Everything was ready to be fulfilled. Uh, yeah. Right. John the Baptist had no Gentile ministry whatsoever. Amen. None. People say, there's a group of Baptists out there that say the church began with John the Baptist. Loony. Amen. Loony. The church began in Acts chapter 2 but wasn't revealed until later through the Apostle Paul. That's right. They weren't even called Christians until Acts chapter 11. Right. Peter's still sitting there in Acts chapter 10 ain't even preached the gospel one time to a Gentile. That's right. Yep. He said, but over in Acts chapter 2, he said that this promises to you and your children and them that are far off. He's talking about Israel that's scattered among the nations. Right. Not talking right. about no Gentiles. Right. You need to go back and read Daniel, see how he used that word of far off. It's in the Bible. God will define it for you. Amen. So here's, here's Christ is here. He shows up. And they start preaching the kingdom at hand. The kingdom at hand. They even asked him after the resurrection, will thou at this time restore? They'd already had the kingdom once. Will thou at this time, when Jesus sits on that throne, he's the last, he's called the king of kings. He's the last in a line of kings that have ruled over Jerusalem. Right. And there'll be no more after him. Amen. He's king of kings, lord of lords. He's the last in the line of David that's going to sit upon that throne and establish an eternal kingdom for God. Amen? But they asked him, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Israel. Israel. That's right. People say they didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. You know what that comes from? A bunch of puffed up egotistical people. I guarantee you they knew more about the nature of the kingdom than some hillbilly in southern West Virginia. <laughs> These men walked with it three and a half years. Are you kidding me? 
If they were confused about the nature of the kingdom, don't you think at some point in time Christ would have been like, guys, you got it wrong. It's just a spiritual kingdom. You don't need to be looking for something physical. No, what he told them was, it's not for you to know the time or the season which the Father put in his own power. Right. That kingdom's coming. Amen. And it could have come here, or it's going to come here, but it's coming. Amen. Now we know, living somewhere up here on this timeline, that Israel can, Israel's continual rejection and blasphemy caused God to eventually turn to the Gentiles and, and gather into the gym, and gather into Jesus Christ a body and a bride consisting of Jew and Gentile. Called the church. Amen. The church which is his body. Amen. Now we know this. Now I'm setting all this up for these parables, folks. If you got this thing, you just go in there and say, now where do these parables belong? It, it'll make it easier. Yep. Instead of you sitting there, if I stare at it long enough, I'll be able to comprehend it. No, you're just going to make something up. Yeah. And then God won't hold you guiltless in the day. Amen. He won't hold you guiltless. He gave you the tools necessary to interpret the Word of God, but if you got a proud heart, you ain't going to find it, and He ain't going to hold you guiltless for it. Alright? Now, now this, this is what happened. The kingdom's coming here. So after the rapture of the church, the kingdom is at hand again. This stuff ain't difficult. Is it at hand here? No. There's not a chance of it coming. Now I know it's not a hand. Paul said that let no man see you that the day of Christ is at hand. That day shall not come except. Right. Amen. One of the things that has to happen is the Gentiles have to fall away. Because we were promised that God's goodness will continue unto us as long as we continue in His goodness. Right. Otherwise we will be cut off like Israel. So one of the things that first has to happen is the Gentiles got to fall away. There must come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed to the son of perdition. Now this, this is the Bible. Who's going to be in power? This is why. Who's going to be in power at this time? Rome. 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 By Roman Empire. So you look at the United Nations now, and they got 12 stars on their flag. Right? Mm -hmm. How many nations are in the European Union? 27. So what does the 12 stars represent? They can't represent nations. They'll tell you what they represent. You don't have to guess. People just guess. Well, they mean 50 states in America, so they must mean 12 nations. Or 27. Yeah, 12 nations. No, there's 27. They tell you that the 12 stars on the European Union flag are the 12 stars on the crown of the woman of Revelation 12. They think that it's Mary. But that woman is Israel. Yep. But here's the scary thing. If they are crowning themselves with the crown of the, of the woman of Revelation 12, you know what the Bible says about her? That she brings forth a man-child to rule the nations. So is the European Union about to unleash a man-child to rule the nations? Amen. Now this is what's going on in our world. Now this, this is it. Now, Christ, through here, He starts teaching the kingdom. And He's, he's plain spoken. He tells it how it is. He doesn't hide anything. In Matthew chapter 10, He sends out the twelve. He says, go to the, go to the lost house of Israel, and as you go, preach the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. That commission was never given to a man preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. He was never told to heal or raise the dead or any of that stuff. Amen. You know Amen. the mark of somebody preaching the gospel of the grace of God? Preaching Jesus. He's despised. He's hated. Mm -hmm. Paul was our. He was he said, he, Paul said, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first he might show a pattern of long <laughs> suffering. Paul was a pattern to us of long suffering. Uh, yeah. Go read about the early church. Go read about them, man. They, they rejected this world, folks. Most of them didn't live 10 years after they got saved. Mm -hmm. Amen. They were fed the lines. They were the, the healing and the signs belonged to a kingdom. They're the signs of a kingdom. Not they have nothing to do with this right here. They're for this. Right. So the signs show back up here. See? And we're starting to see a revival of some of that stuff. People wanting to see signs and wonders and all that garbage. 
Alright, so now you've had John the Baptist preach. You've had Jesus Christ preaching. And now you've had the twelve preaching the kingdom. What kind of results did they have? Not good. That's the way it is. Jesus Christ would be rejected quicker than any preacher you've ever seen in southern West Virginia. Amen. Amen. He'd go into the house of prayers. People, but people, people think, oh, we can fellowship with people like that. Let me tell you something. They reject my Lord and Savior today. I can't fellowship with none of them. Right. I'm telling you, I know that Jesus Christ could walk into some of these churches in southern West Virginia and stand up and preach, and they'd be ready to <coughs> gnash on him with their teeth by the time he was done. Yep. Yeah. You don't believe me? Go down there and stand in his place from time to time. Amen. Everybody in southern West Virginia is Christians. And you knock on your door and try to read Preach the Bible to them, you'll find out real quick they're not. <laughs> but they go to church. They just fellowship with like-minded people. John the Baptist, he couldn't preach in most Baptist churches in America. Right. Why? John wasn't big on suit and ties. <laughs> he didn't like it. Hey, man. John, John just show up in a camel skin beard down. I mean, you think you think somebody, you think a razor never touched his face. I got an Uncle Faun that's been growing, a, little Faun has been growing a beard for at least 10, 15 years. That thing's down to here. It is too that long. It's the end of road at that time. Oh, don't matter. <laughs> I, I, a razor never touched John the Baptist. Never. Thing probably knotted up, nappy. Birds living in it. <laughs> then he shows up down at down at Sword of the Lord Conference. How you doing, Brother Smith? I'm here to preach for you. Not looking like that, you ain't. <laughs> so you know what John Baptist do? He say, if that's fine, he goes stand on the steps. Generation of vipers. That's how they men were. They rejected men. The twelve were rejected. Jesus Christ were rejected. Jesus Christ was rejected. John the Baptist was rejected by Israel. Yeah. Five thousand was following Jesus Christ at one time. He found a boy and said, "Well, you got there a couple of fish and a couple of loaves. Let me have that." Fed five thousand and took up more than what was he had to begin with. That was what was left. Show us a sign. That was the very next thing they said. Yeah. yeah. Show us a sign. Amen. Show us a sign. Yeah. Christ said, <laughs> Christ said, you didn't follow me for the words. You followed me because your bellies were full. Right. And then he starts preaching, I am the true bread. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood. And he's like, this is a hard saying. Who can hear? Ran off. You want to run people off, just tell them what Jesus said. Amen. Amen. This is what we're dealing with because he gets over here now. Matthew chapter 11. He starts pronouncing judgment upon the cities of Israel because of their rejection. You know what he says to them cities in Jerusalem? If the works done in, done in thee had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. If the works done in thee, O Bethsaida and Capernaum, if the works done in thee had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago and would have remained until this day. Right. What's he talking about? He's pronouncing judgment on Jewish cities and talking about Gentile cities. The warnings are coming. He comes over into chapter 12 and says, Nineveh shall rise in judgment against this generation. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is among you. Mm -hmm. The queen of the south shall rise in judgment, Gentiles, because she traveled to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is among you. Amen. Gentiles going to rise in judgment on the Jews. Why? Because they heard it, and they wouldn't. So he's starting to warn them here. Amen. And he tells them there that the only sign that's going to be given them is that of the prophet who? Jonah. Jonah. See, Jonah went to the belly of the well for three days and three nights, and when he came out of the belly of the well, he went and preached repentance to a bunch of Gentiles. Christ is warning them. They didn't get the message. Yeah. They continued to reject, and so what you have now is a bunch of Gentiles repenting. 
and God spared their lives. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's what's going on. So when he gets over to chapter 13, you see Christ is beginning to reject them because they rejected him. So he gets into Matthew chapter 13 and he changes his manner of speaking. It's no more simple, don't say a fool or you'll be in danger of judgment, not plain spoken. The kingdom of heaven is like to a man that sowed seed. Right? The kingdom of heaven is like to a mustard seed. Why did he do it? The reason he did it was to blind people. And it's working. Amen. Amen. Pick up, pick up any commentary. On, get five commentaries on Matthew chapter 13. Get over there and read it. And you'll find five different interpretations of those parables. There's only one way to interpret whosoever was angry at his brother without cause. Right? That's simple, common English. When a man starts saying the kingdom of heaven is like unto a woman which took leaven and hid it three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. Now you're on dangerous ground. <laughs> All right. Christ is speaking like this to blind people. That's not a good place to start getting your doctrine. Amen. Amen. There's something weird about Christians wanting to go to hard to understand passages to build the churches. They always begin with the hard to understand to overrule what's easy to understand in that book. Amen? There's nothing funnier than me standing up and saying, Jesus Christ said, He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I should lose nothing but raise it up at the last day. Amen. There's nothing hard to understand about that. If you will come to Christ, he will for no reason cast you out. Whoever comes to Christ will be raised up at the last day, and he will lose none of them. Amen. Nothing hard to understand it. But, preacher, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, I've dealt with it. Amen. You love going to hard to understand passages to overrule the simplicity of God's word. <laughs> right. Amen. That's a devil. That's what a devil is. <laughs> Amen. Hath God not said, Oh no, but ye shall not shortly die. Run from them birds. Amen. Run from them as quick as you can. Amen. That's a devil trying to talk you out of your salvation. Right. Right. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, the first parable we saw was the parable of the soul. Now these parables here are looking forward over into here during the 70th week of Daniel and also across throughout the church age. They're mysteries. Mysteries of the kingdom. Now, <clears throat> that's something else strange there. Matthew chapter 11, Christ tells them as he sends them out to preach. It might be Matthew chapter 10, but as he sends them out to preach, he says, persecuted in this city, flee into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall have not gone over the cities of Israel until the Son of Man be come. <coughs> Did he come? <coughs> no. You can only explain that thing with this gap right here, folks. It's the only way can it can be explained. Now the parable of the sower we looked at, that thing has an application to the kingdom of heaven. It can be applied to the kingdom of heaven. Christ tells you what the word there is or what the seed is. It's when someone hears the word of the kingdom. It's not money, Jesse. Amen. Declares. Amen. But over in Luke, he says, when he says that the seed is when any man hears the word of God. That means the parable of the sower has an application to both kingdoms. Amen. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And when you read the parable in Luke chapter 8, and when you read the one here in Matthew 13, you're going to notice subtle differences. For one, in, my, in, Luke's, in Luke's parable, he says, he says that, that that fell among the wayside is when, any, is when they hear the word, and, and, and before they can understand it, the wicked one comes and takes it away, lest they should hear and believe and be saved. Right. That's the only seed in that parable that's lost. Yeah. But you get into this one here in Matthew 13 when it deals with the kingdom of heaven, three out of four of those seeds are lost. Because the only 
When you're dealing with the kingdom of God, the only requirement for entering the kingdom of God is a new birth. And Christ told you in John chapter 3 the requirement for a new birth was for as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's right. You're dying just like the Jew in the wilderness was. They said, pray to God that He'll take this evil from us. God said, make a brazen serpent. Whoever looks upon it be healed. Amen. And then people in there sick and dying in the wilderness and that snake was lifted up, that brazen serpent. And when they looked, they were made every whit whole. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And as Moses lifted up that serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Right. A bunch of dying sinners down here on this world. Amen. And when we preach the cross, through the hearing of the preaching of the cross, they can look and be saved. Amen. Uh, this one's different. Yeah. There's a righteousness you must have to enter that one. <coughs> yeah. And a bunch of kingdom of God rejecting people on this earth right now are getting ready to go through the worst time the world's ever seen. Right here. They've done rejected the kingdom of God. They've mocked and scoffed the new birth and the resurrection and the virgin birth and the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they're going into a period of time where God's going to require a standard and a moral for people to have if they ever hope of entering that kingdom when it Amen. comes. Amen. You know what John the Baptist said about that kingdom when it comes? He said the axe is laid to the root of the tree and every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Try that. There's nothing easy about salvation in this period right here. There ain't a thing in the world easy about it. Amen? Yeah. I mean, you change the work of the Holy Spirit. No longer down here convicting and enlightening. And the church is no longer here withholding evil. Amen. The church is gone. The Holy Spirit's ministry has changed. Bibles disappear. Burned. Yeah. Amen. Satan manifest in the flesh ruling over the nations. Mm -hmm. Got the whole people under some kind of magic spell right. where they just seem to, when he speaks, they just seem to fall and worship this man. Legalized pornography. Saturday cartoons replaced by pornography on the television. <coughs> the weather women get up. When they do the weather, they take off their shirts. They already do it in Europe. Don't tell me, man. Topless weather readers. Right. You think it's going to be easy? Yeah, right. No. Daddy, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. We haven't eaten in a week. I can't buy anything. I don't have a mark. Go get it. Well, we can hunt. Bunch of disease ridden animals. It's coming. Guns taken away. Amen. One out of four people, or three out of four people during the tribulation, if Jesus Christ is right in the parable of the sower, three out of four that hear the word of the kingdom is going to perish and go to hell. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So then he get into the parable of the wheats and tares. This is a fundamental Baptist favorite to getting people to retread. Amen. Mm. We had we had three hundred just realized they weren't saved and finally got I've heard that story so many times in Baptist churches. Woman just came forward this morning, realized she wasn't saved. What is wrong with churches that people are constantly there for years and years and years? having believed on Jesus Christ and suddenly realizing they're not saved. And what did they do different this time? <laughs> did they believe on Him really, really hard the second time? <laughs> the only requirement for salvation is faith in the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Well, I didn't believe right. I wasn't sorry enough for my sins. Blow it out your nose. The only requirement for salvation in this age is the hearing of the gospel and through hearing, believing, and through believing, calling upon the name of our Lord. Amen. Amen, Amen Paul. That's right. Unless you just want to rip Romans chapter 10 out of your Bible. They get over there and they teach the wheats and the tares. And these fundamental Baptist men, they make a mess of it. Do they make a mess of it? Amen. I'm a fundamental Baptist. It's a fundamental Baptist church. But they make a mess of it. Yeah. 
the field. The fundamental Baptist says or teach it like the field is the church, whereas Christ said the field is the world. Yep. The fundamental Baptist says that the, that the good seed is Christians. It's Christians. Real Christians. Yeah. I can't forget that. Yeah. These are possessors. Yeah. Not professors. You got it? <laughs> these, these, are, these are real Christians. <laughs> whereas, whereas Jesus Christ says that it's the children of the kingdom. Amen. The fundamental Baptists get over there and they say the bad seed is false Christians. Whereas Jesus Christ said they are children of the wicked one. They are children of the wicked. Right? Right. The fundamental Baptist says the harvest is the rapture. But Jesus says it's the end of the world. Amen. This is the difference. There's the rapture. There's the end of the world. Seven years separated. The reapers, they really don't talk about the reapers. But who comes down at the rapture and gathers the church? Christ. The Lord himself. Right. Christ said the reapers are the angels. You couldn't make it the rapture if you had to, unless you just you just reject at least five verses where Christ is interpreting it for you. It's so clear what it is. It's right here. Amen. Second coming. Amen. Somebody is gathered and burned. Somebody is gathered and saved. That's Revelation chapter 14. There's two harvests that take place in Revelation 14. One like the Son of Man shows up with a great sickle and somebody says, thrust thy sickle into the earth for the harvest, for the time of the harvest is there and the earth is ripe and the Son of Man sticks his harvest, his sickle in there and harvest is a great harvest. What happens to him? It don't say. But then another angel comes out having a great sickle and it says, thrust thy sickle into the earth for the harvest has come and the earth is ripe and that angel sticks its uh, sickle down into the earth and takes that gathering and puts it into the wine press. There they are, gathered up for you. God says, what is that, about 800 million foot soldiers? <laughs> what is that, about 800 million United Nations troops bringing peace to the earth? He'll look at his son, Psalm 45, and say, Gird thy sword upon thy side, Amen. and ride, ride in your majesty, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things, and the king shall strike through. He shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Right. They'll be Amen. down there, and Jews be down there, uh, outside the welling wall, beating their heads on the wall, be a group of them down in the desert. Amen. They'll be out there, hostile, lie, lie. Begging God to save him. Amen. Amen. Standing out there in the Mount of Nob, Isaiah chapter 10. About that time they hear, Woo! Woo! Hear the loudest <laughs> roar they've ever heard. And when that God speaks that time, it's not just going to shake the earth, it's going to shake the heavens. Amen. The stars will start falling. The mountains start fleeing and splitting and cracking. And they look up, and here he comes on a white horse. <laughs> What's he do? He takes every one of them and casts them into a big bonfire. That's the parable of the wheats and tares. You ain't heard the sword of the Lord preach it like that in 60 years. Amen. They use it to scare Christians. Amen. To get them to the altar. So that they can go to the omelet shop in the Waffle House with a bunch of doctors and other preachers after they're done. We had good services. We barely had 45 at the altar. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fixed, man. I've had them guys come here and put on tent meetings and get up and preach and preach a, just preach sorry messages, man. Just messages. I I believe my son can preach better messages than some of them clowns. And when they give the altar call, come down there and get in the preacher's ear. Y'all need to get down around that altar and entice some of these people to come. Yeah. No thank you. Amen. Yeah. No thank you. I don't want no part of that false, phony garbage. Amen. 
Don't want no part of it. I've seen the power of preaching, man. I've seen it. I seen a boy coming to my church. I'm ranting tonight. I understand that, but it's good stuff. Hey, I, I seen a boy coming to my church one night, an atheist, man. Just a week before, told me he didn't believe in God. Nobody had to come to an altar and entice that boy. I got up preached on Romans chapter 10 that night. The righteousness of God and our own righteousness. And by the end of that hour, I said, is there anybody here that knows they're lost and wants to be saved? And that hand went. <laughs> hey, man. He didn't get saved that night, but he went home and watched a message by Peter Ruckman on how easy it was to be saved. And he said, is it that easy? They said it is. And he got saved that night. Yeah, man. Amen. That's power. Amen. Man didn't even believe in God to get saved in about a total of eight hours. That's power. Yeah. Amen. The preaching of the cross. That's right. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. 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 I wouldn't have to come to an altar and entice them if you preach and quit bragging. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. God the Holy Spirit get them down there. You just shut up about how many you baptized and how many you got on Sunday school and how many buses you're running. Just shut up, preach the book, man. Amen. Amen. The third parable here is the parable of the mustard seed. I ain't going to keep you too much longer. Oh, come on, man. The parable of the mustard seed. Now, when you get over in the Revelation, there's seven churches. And there seems that I haven't been able to put it all together. There seems to be some kind of correlation between these seven parables and these seven churches. Alright? For example, the church in Ephesus was the fully was a church that was fully purposed, known for its evangelism. Amen. Alright, they've always said that represents the apostolic church, the parable of the sower. A sower went out sowing seed. The weeds and the tares seems to correlate with this persecuted church that I don't. Maybe been able to put it together. But the church of Pergamos seems to have something to do with the, the parable of the mustard seed. Thyatira, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel to teach and seduce my servants. The fourth parable that shows up is the woman and the leaven. Right? Yeah. The hid treasure, the church of Sardis. What is Sardis? Sardis. Is that a, is that a treasure? Is it a stone? Yeah. The Pearl of Great Price, the church at Philadelphia. I'll make the whole world come and bow before thy feet and make them know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept my word. Thou hast little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. That's the Pearl of Great Price. And then Laodicea seems to have something to do with the net. Now like I said, I haven't been able to put it all together. The reason I bring this up because these two right here, Pergamos and the mustard seed, correlate perfectly. Alright? Christ says there, and he says, The kingdom of heaven, verse 32, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Can I tell you what it's impossible to be? It's impossible for that thing to be the church. It's impossible. The church is not going to become the greatest among trees. What are trees in the Bible? Anybody know? Are they kingdoms? Remember Daniel? That dream over in Daniel chapter 4 where that great tree whose top reached into the heavens and the birds come and lodging in it. And then the interpretation of that thing is that that tree was the kingdom of Babylon and the watchers and the holy ones coming down into that thing. Let me tell you something, folks. Angels take place in our governments. You're told that all throughout the Bible. How many times? <coughs> you think y'all think this stuff's just coincidence? There in World War II, there in the Revolution, so many times in war, the weather has caused the war to turn around. Right. 
and go in the other direction. Just coincidence. Mm -hmm. God told David one time, he said, David, he said, don't you go down in the battle until you hear the rushing of the wind in the tops of the trees. When you hear the rushing of the wind in the tops of the trees, go down in the battle because that means I've given them into thy hand. What was going in the tops of the trees? <laughs> Angels going down in the battle. There went the Lord before us. Charge. You see, angels take place in government. Hey Amen. That's why you kill Saddam Hussein and another one ten times worse shows up just like him because there's a prince over there. Amen. Been there for thousands of years. All right. You, you kill Ahmadinejad, you'll have another prince just like him. Hey Amen. Evil princes. Then in some parts of the land, you got some good ones. The prince of Israel is Michael. We know that. He fought against the prince of Persia. The only one that stands for his people Israel. But trees in the Bible are governments or kingdoms or nations. Amen? What is the field? World. We just read that, didn't we? So this tree is a nation or a kingdom that's in the world. Started off small. What he's talking about is visible Christianity. Becoming an empire in this world that has nothing to do with Christianity at all. Right. When that thing started out, it started out with 12 fishermen. <coughs> right? Started out with 12 fishermen. Fishermen! You awake? Now it's become every person, every president stands up and remember, God bless the USA. Yeah. Everybody's Christian. Bill Clinton, you know, fornicating in the White House, committing adultery in the White House, coming out of Southern Baptist churches on Sunday. You know. The whole world's Christian. Yeah. It's an empire. Yeah. It's an empire. But let me tell you something about this empire. That thing started out with 12 fishermen, and around 325 A.D., a man by the name of Constantine. Every Roman emperor before him tried to abolish Christianity through killing and murder. Nero, uh, uh, Diocletian, Domitian, all of them tried to have Christianity wiped off of the face of the earth through death and torture and bloodshed. Yep. Constantine rose up, made Christianity the state religion of Rome. Became an overnight Christianity became an empire. Became part of the Roman Empire. Alright? But Christ says about that thing. He taught at Pergamus, the city of Pergamus, which means much marriage, and said that they, that they hold there the doctrine of Balaam. What did Balaam teach Israel to do? To have unequal yokes. Right with people outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. The Moabite daughters come over and married, in, married the Jewish men and before you knew it, they plumb eating up in idolatry. Yeah. Constantine taught the church how to be unequally yoked together with the world. Amen? Amen. There's nothing funnier than a bunch of Christians walking around <laughs> expecting governments that are handed out by Satan to give them rights. Satan runs the governments, man. Yeah, man. He said these are mine and I give them to who I will and then you act like they're supposed to care about your rights as Christians. Yeah. Bunch of cry baby. Suck it up and man up and go Amen. to town. Amen. Hey, Amen. They won't let me pray. Oh, shut up and pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Won't let me take my Bible to school. Shut up and take it. Amen. What are they going to do? Put you in jail. You won't be the first one. Amen. They might kill us. You won't be the first one to do that either. But you'll look more like your Savior than you do out there whining. All this stuff, man. Amen. We want to be a Christian nation. Well, it ain't going to happen. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not going to happen. No. Amen. Half the people that put one nation under God and, and, and stuff like that in the, in the Pledge of Allegiance and on our dollar bill was a, was a bunch of Freemason, Luciferian, Satan worshipers anyway. Right. 
You don't know what their ideas are. You have no idea. Yeah. That stuff was put there in the 50s. Man, it wasn't even a part of our founding. My. One nation under God. Hey, people just assume it's been on the money the whole time. No, it's put on there by a bunch of masons. And then they put their little unbuilt pyramid with their all seeing eye over it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and talked about a new world order. Yeah. I don't trust them men. They're Luciferians. Amen? Yeah. They think the God of our Lord Jesus Christ is a mean tyrant and Lucifer's coming to liberate us. That's what they think. Amen. Yeah. Amen. But you know what they do it under? The disguise of Christianity. Yeah, yeah that's right. Picture of picture during World War II. Stalin, a communist. Churchill. What kind of government what kind of government's England have? Socialists. Then monarchy. Then FDR. You know, the great republic. Constitutional Republic of America. Three different branches of government supposedly hate themselves and during World War II. They're all sitting on the same bench like this right here. Pictures of George Washington. You ever seen them? Yeah. Last picture of Abraham Lincoln before they blew his brains out. Two men standing there like this. Y'all seen the picture right there outside that camp during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln standing there, two men like this. So what are you talking about, preacher? It's the hidden hand of masonry. Vladimir Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, FDR, Truman, Roosevelt, all of them. They founded the United Nations. They started wars. They're on the same side. They start wars and play this thing out so that they can get their agendas passed. You know what they wanted to come out of World War II? Zionism and the United Nations. And they got it. Right. right. They got it. We can't never have another war like that. The whole world's got to unite so we don't have to fight no more wars like that. And they all do it under the disguise of Christianity. The Holy Roman Empire, nothing Christian about it. Amen? Yeah. Right. Nothing Christian about it. Most of our forefathers, we thought... Good golly, Christian men. Benjamin Franklin belonged to a secret society called the Hellfire Club. They believed in getting sloppy drunk and having orgies. Thank you. Have a nice day. That's why he loved France so much. <laughs> he said that, that he said he never met a man speak like George Whitfield. George Whitfield tried to lead him to the Lord many times, and he wouldn't ever accept Jesus Christ.